Chapter 7 of At the Earth's Core. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scott Carpenter. At the Earth's Core by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 7 Freedom. Once out of the direct path of the animal, fear of it left me, but another emotion as quickly gripped me hope of escape that the demoralized condition of the guards made possible for the instant. I thought of Perry, but for the hope that I might better encompass his release if myself free, I should have put the thought of freedom from me at once. As it was, I hastened on toward the right, searching for an exit toward which no Sagoths were fleeing, and at last I found it, a low narrow aperture leading into a dark corridor. Without thought of the possible consequence, I darted into the shadows of the tunnel, feeling my way along through the gloom for some distance. The noises of the amphitheater had grown fainter and fainter, until now all was as silent as the tomb about me. Faint light filtered from above through occasional ventilating and lighting tubes, but it was scarce sufficient to enable my human eyes to cope with the darkness, and so I was forced to move with extreme care, feeling my way along step by step, with a hand upon the wall beside me. Presently the light increased, and a moment later, to my delight, I came upon a flight of steps leading upward, at the top of which the brilliant light of the noonday sun shone through an opening in the ground. Cautiously I crept up the stairway to the tunnel's end, and peering out, saw the broad plain of Futra before me. The numerous lofty granite towers which marked the several entrances to the subterranean city were all in front of me. Behind, the plain stretched level and unbroken to the nearby foothills. I had come to the surface then, beyond the city, and my chances for escape seemed much enhanced. My first impulse was to await darkness before attempting to cross the plain, so deeply implanted are habits of thought, but of a sudden I recollected the perpetual noonday brilliance which envelops Pellucidar, and with a smile I stepped forth into the daylight. Rank grass, waist-high, grows upon the plain of Futra. The gorgeous flowering grass of the inner world, each particular blade of which is tipped with a tiny five-pointed blossom, brilliant little stars of varying colors that twinkle in the green foliage to add still another charm to the weird yet lovely landscape. But then the only aspect which attracted me was the distant hills in which I hoped to find sanctuary, and so I hastened on, trampling the myriad beauties beneath my hurrying feet. Perry says that the force of gravity is less upon the surface of the inner world than upon that of the outer. He explained it all to me once, but I was never particularly brilliant in such matters, and so most of it has escaped me. As I recall it, the difference is due in some part to the counter-attraction of that portion of the Earth's crust directly opposite the spot upon the face of Pellucidar at which one's calculations are being made. Be that as it may, it always seemed to me that I moved with greater speed and agility within Pellucidar than upon the outer surface. There was a certain airy lightness of step that was most pleasing, and a feeling of bodily detachment which I can only compare with that occasionally experienced in dreams. And as I crossed Futra's flower-bespangled plain that time I seemed almost to fly though how much of the sensation was due to Perry's suggestion, and how much to actuality, I am sure I do not know. The more I thought of Perry, the less pleasure I took in my newfound freedom. There could be no liberty for me within Pellucidar unless the old man shared it with me, and only the hope that I might find some way to encompass his release kept me from turning back to Futra. Just how I was to help Perry I could scarce imagine but I hoped that some fortuitous circumstance might solve the problem for me. It was quite evident, however, that little less than a miracle could aid me, for what could I accomplish in this strange world, naked and unarmed? It was even doubtful that I could retrace my steps to Futra should I once pass beyond view of the plain, and even were that possible, what aid could I bring to Perry, no matter how far I wandered? The case looked more and more hopeless the longer I viewed it, Yet with a stubborn persistency I forged ahead toward the foothills. Behind me no sign of pursuit developed. Before me I saw no living thing. It was as though I moved through a dead and forgotten world. 
I have no idea, of course, how long it took me to reach the limit of the plain, but at last I entered the foothills, following a pretty little canyon upward toward the mountains. Beside me frolicked a laughing brooklet hurrying upon its noisy way down to the silent sea. In its quieter pools I discovered many small fish, of four or five pound weight, I should imagine. In appearance, except as to size and color, they were not unlike the whale of our own seas. As I watched them playing about, I discovered not only that they suckled their young, but that at intervals they rose to the surface to breathe as well as to feed upon certain grasses and a strange scarlet lichen which grew upon the rocks just above the waterline. It was this last habit that gave me the opportunity I craved to capture one of these herbivorous cetaceans, that is what Perry calls them, and make as good a meal as one can on raw warm-blooded fish, but I had become rather used by this time to the eating of food in its natural state, though I still balked on the eyes and entrails, much to the amusement of Gack, to whom I always passed these delicacies. Crouching beside the brook, I waited until one of the diminutive purple whales rose to nibble at the long grasses which overhung the water, and then, like the beast of prey that man really is, I sprang upon my victim, appeasing my hunger while he yet wriggled to escape. Then I drank from the clear pool, and after washing my hands and face, continued my flight. Above the source of the brook I encountered a rugged climb to the summit of a long ridge. Beyond was a steep declivity to the shore of a placid, inland sea, upon the quiet surface of which lay several beautiful islands. The view was charming in the extreme, and as no man or beast was to be seen that might threaten my newfound liberty, I slid over the edge of the bluff, and, half sliding, half falling, dropped into the delightful valley, the very aspect of which seemed to offer a haven of peace and security. The gently sloping beach along which I walked was thickly strewn with strangely shaped colored shells, some empty, others still housing as varied a multitude of mollusks as ever might have drawn out their sluggish lives upon the silent shores of the antediluvian seas of the outer crust. As I walked I could not but compare myself with the first man of that other world, so complete the solitude which surrounded me, so primal and untouched the virgin wonders and beauties of adolescent nature. I felt myself a second Adam, wending my lonely way through the childhood of a world, searching for my Eve, and at the thought there rose before my mind's eye the exquisite outlines of a perfect face, surmounted by a loose pile of wondrous raven hair. As I walked my eyes were bent upon the beach so that it was not until I had come quite upon it that I discovered that which shattered all my beautiful dream of solitude and safety and peace and primal overlordship. The thing was a hollowed log drawn upon the sands, and in the bottom of it lay a crude paddle. The rude shock of awakening to what doubtless might prove some new form of danger was still upon me when I heard a rattling of loose stones from the direction of the bluff, and turning my eyes in that direction I beheld the author of the disturbance a great copper-colored man running rapidly toward me. There was that in the haste with which he came which seemed quite sufficiently menacing, so that I did not need the added evidence of brandishing spear and scowling face to warn me that I was in no safe position. But whither to flee was indeed a momentous question. The speed of the fellow seemed to preclude the possibility of escaping him upon the open beach. There was but a single alternative, the rude skiff, and with a celerity which equaled his, I pushed the thing into the sea, and as it floated, gave a final shove, and clambered in over the end. A cry of rage rose from the owner of the primitive craft, and an instant later his heavy stone-tipped spear grazed my shoulder and buried itself in the bow of the boat beyond. Then I grasped the paddle, and with feverish haste, urged the awkward, wobbly thing out upon the surface of the sea. A glance over my shoulder showed me that the copper-colored one had plunged in after me and was swimming rapidly in pursuit. His mighty strokes bade fair to close up the distance between us in short order, for at best I could make but slow progress with my unfamiliar craft, which nosed stubbornly in every direction but that which I desired to follow, so that fully half my energy was expended in turning its blunt prow back into the course. 
I had covered some hundred yards from shore when it became evident that my pursuer must grasp the stern of the skiff within the next half-dozen strokes. In a frenzy of despair I bent to the grandfather of all paddles in a hopeless effort to escape, and still the copper giant behind me gained and gained. His hand was reaching upward for the stern when I saw a sleek, sinuous body shoot from the depths below. The man saw it, too, and the look of terror that overspread his face assured me that I need have no further concern as to him, for the fear of certain death was in his look. And then about him coiled the great slimy folds of a hideous monster of that prehistoric deep, a mighty serpent of the sea, with fanged jaws and darting forked tongue, with bulging eyes and bony protuberances upon head and snout that formed short, stout horns. As I looked at that hopeless struggle, my eyes met those of the doomed man, and I could have sworn that in his I saw an expression of hopeless appeal. But whether I did or not, there swept through me a sudden compassion for the fellow. He was indeed a brother man, and that he might have killed me with pleasure had he caught me, was forgotten in the extremity of his danger. Unconsciously I had ceased paddling as the serpent rose to engage my pursuer, so now the skiff still drifted close beside the two. The monster seemed to be but playing with his victim before he closed his awful jaws upon him and dragged him down to his dark den beneath the surface to devour him. The huge snake-like body coiled and uncoiled about its prey. The hideous gaping jaws snapped in the victim's face. The forked tongue, lightning-like, ran in and out upon the copper skin. Nobly the giant battled for his life, beating with his stone hatchet against the bony armor that covered the frightful carcass. But for all the damage he inflicted, he might as well have struck with his open palm. At last I could endure no longer to sit supinely by, while a fellow man was dragged down to a horrible death by that repulsive reptile. Embedded in the prow of the skiff lay the spear that had been cast after me by him who I suddenly desired to save. With a wrench I tore it loose, and standing upright in the wobbly log drove it with all the strength of my two arms straight into the gaping jaws of the hydrophidian. With a loud hiss the creature abandoned its prey to turn upon me, but the spear embedded in its throat prevented it from seizing me, though it came near to overturning the skiff in its mad efforts to reach me. End of chapter 7